Okay. Uh, I'm doing raw blanks today. So we'll see what happens. Hey guys, doing uh, raw blanks today. <clears throat> it's blanks that look like this. Got the crank in them. They've still got plenty of axing to do, but they're an efficient shape to ship. With some good wood for carving in South Carolina. Oh gosh. I don't know. Probably you have some sort of maple down there, yeah? Uh, you might have walnut, butternut. Those are both good. You have some cherry, or uh, don't you have tulip trees down there? That could also be quite good. Uh, you know, it depends on where in South Carolina you are. My brother used to live in Greenville. Um, and they had different trees there than down by the coast. So, this person asked for uh, some raw blanks that were made out of crooks if possible. I don't have crooks available as I think he was thinking of them, but I do have uh, some limbs of maple that got taken down this fall. And uh, <clears throat> that's... Uh, Probably the best I got. So with my raw blanks, it's more about... Hi, Joseph. It's more about uh, giving somebody a really clean piece of wood to work with. Uh, so I put the crank in. I draw a shape for them. But I really want to make sure that the wood itself is as forgiving as possible. Whew. This maple's tough to cut through. Whoop. questions guys what saw am I using I'm using an ARS uh, little uh, pruning saw it's nice because it's got a short blade I usually rotate my saw blades oh, every couple of months this one's almost on its way out they're very aggressive when they're fresh but this uh, this sugar maple is a lot tougher than the birch or the cherry Uh, you know what else is on my way out is my club is starting to crack at the handle. But it still does the trick. So when the wood starts to fall from the uh, from the chopping block here, it's important that you let it fall so that it's not um not losing track of what your axe is doing. Just let the wood fall and hold on to your axe. So I do round the top and bottom or push the back on the bowl and the handle of these blanks even though it's less efficient to do it with this width mostly um, so that they nest nicely in the box. Uh, 
What if it's a scientist and asked? Joseph, I didn't see what else your what your wife asked. Any tips for first attempt at method of axing out the crank? Yes. Uh, make sure you have plenty of room. So if it's your first time and you're going to do an eating spoon, take a 16-inch log so that you can stay way far away from your hands um, as you as you go about it. Now, this you can actually get several. If I do them uh, radially split, I can get several out of this log because it's wide enough. So, so I will. Um, but yeah, by giving yourself a larger log to work with, you can uh, you can keep yourself safe, and that's the most important thing. Oh, you asked your wife asked what journals am I editing? Uh, well, so I edit manuscripts that are being submitted to journals, and it's largely uh, stuff that's being submitted to uh, entomology, biological control, that type of journal. Um, but it's all over the map in terms of that, because these entomologists are approaching their discipline from all different angles. So they tend to find journals that are very niche for them. Um, yeah, does your wife, uh, is she affiliated with any journals, Joseph? So you can see that as a beginner, or even as myself, it's nice to have a longer piece of wood than you need because it lets you stay away from the ends and stay away from your fingers. It also lets you avoid unexpected things like this little spot where a, a branch pushed through. Um, so by having a longer piece of wood, I can adjust the one side or the other side if I open it up and there's some unexpected stuff. Yeah, I know, right? Who knew? Well, I figure uh, this whole Instagram Live thing seems to be a useful thing for people, so I thought I'd do it as much as I felt like doing it. So let me know, guys, if you find this useful. It's not always going to be, you know, as exciting to watch. Like, I kind of think this one's not going to be exciting to watch because it's basically just me uh, doing a lot of sawing and splitting and stuff. Nursing science. Yeah, I don't know anything about that whole medical is, is a whole other thing. So you can see when I'm axing down here, a couple things. One is that I'm axing to the side of me. So if, if my axe goes too far, I'm not going straight into my leg. So turn your body to the side. And then when I'm farther away from my body, down low like this, I can be a little more aggressive. And then watch how nice and gentle I get as I get closer to my hand. So a good rule of thumb is to never let the axe go up above your hand, particularly if it's close to your hand. So with these, I like to nip off some of the back. <clears throat> Good. I'm glad you guys find this useful. Uh, and then that just makes it easier to trim the length. And boy, this birch is cutting like butter. So typically with these raw blanks, people just have me fill up a, one of these post office uh, flat rate boxes for them because that's the most efficient way to do it. And voila. So that's what a raw blank looks like. Hello from New Zealand. Am I self-taught? Um, yeah, basically. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've spent a lot of time reading other people's blogs and Instagram posts and just digesting as much as I possibly can. Um, but yeah, largely self-taught. Is the width of pitch of your axe head important when roughing out blanks? Um, 
by that do you mean the length of the blade this way or do you mean the actual bevel on the angle shake and bake can you can you specify thanks very much for the kind words so this is black birch which as you can see has uh started to get some lovely coloration just from sitting around the log black birch i think is my favorite birch to carve it's just lovely and clean and it smells great and it takes a pretty crisp finish um bevel and thickness uh so i have not modified this this is a standard grenfers brooks carving axe um i haven't modified it in any way i find that it bites in lovely um the only time i've modified axes is when i get an axe off of um like at a tag sale and then usually it's uh too fat because a lot of american style hatchets let's see there's one kicking around here oh that's not a great example um hold on <clears throat> so this is more of uh an axe head but this is one i got at a tag sale a long time ago so they'll have these cheeks that are quite fat here because they're designed to um to split apart wood so they do that quite well and they don't do this part as well that being said uh, I do think that um, it's possible to have your axe be too sharp and then it bites in and tends to stick rather than popping the wood apart. So I prefer to have my uh, axe pop the wood apart. Um, river birch is good for carving. I imagine so. I mean, every birch is different. Uh, certain birches are stringier than others. Gray birch around here is an ornamental tree that you can find in a lot of places and it's not nearly as nice to carve as this, but it'll do fine. Um, they spalt in different ways too, I imagine. They attract and have relationships with different fungi. Um, so here's a piece of wood that is thinner because of when the axe came down into the wood, it, uh, let's say the, the log was over on this side. So the axe comes down to the wood and it tends to make the split run out so it gets narrower on the outside as it pops off. Um, and this is actually fine. So I just wanted to point this out as, you know, this is totally fine. Just the main thing is I would orient the spoon bowl over on this side of things. How tall am I, proportion-wise, thinking about buying that axe? I'm uh, 5'11", um, 6 feet on a good day, but really I'm 5'11". Yeah, I would recommend this axe. Um, when I started out, I, I couldn't fathom spending this much money on an axe, but honestly, it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful. It's, you know, you get used to whatever axe you have. Um, and it took me a while to get used to this one because I had been using Robin Woods's carving axe, um, which was very light. Um, and my, my carving style had become adapted to that style of light axe. And I found that I didn't have the arm strength to immediately start using this axe right away for everything. But what I started doing is I would use the Robin Wood axe and then when my when I got really tired like on some day when I was making a lot of blanks um, I would switch to this axe at the end and it would allow me to um, I would slow down and let the weight of the axe really do a lot of the a lot of the work. So now you can see the angle in it. So it's important that you come down from this side and that you also come down from this side so that when you're cutting the top of the handle, you can cut towards yourself and you know that it's not going to dig into the grain. If you just leave this flat, not only does it do a weird thing in terms of almost having like a droopy bowl to your spoon, but uh, it's ambiguous which way you should be carving it. Um, so I always come down from the tip of the bowl down to the crank and then I dive the top from the tip of the handle down to the crank as well. And if you want to do a dolphin hump or anything like that, leave yourself some room for that, but then come down all the way into the crank from the other side. That one is going to be pretty. Someone's getting lucky. Um, let's see. A lot of times when I make these raw blanks, I like to give people options. It seems like, why not? So... This one, I'm going to leave as a uh, smallish cooking spoon. 
that's uh, you know just the right size if you're cooking for yourself and maybe one other person. You don't feel like using something enormous. There was a skunk that walked past our house about a, two weeks ago now. But it must have sprayed up the road because the smell has been lingering. And it's been sort of wet enough and damp enough that every time there's uh, moisture in the air, that skunk smell comes back. It's funny how it lingers that way. Hold on, I'll check out that comment in a second. <clears throat> it's axing blanks. You're axing blanks while watching this. Oh, lovely weather. Yeah. Well, it's lovely weather too here. Not to uh, not to show you up, but it's 60 degrees outside and sunny. So you can see I moved my carving stump out from the greenhouse where it's 85 and unpleasant. Um, and into the shade of the woodshed where I uh, usually have my stuff set up in the summertime. So this is where I'll be. So, boom. Another... Blank. I should probably stack these up so I don't lose track of them. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, on a piece of wood like this, where birch has this funny thing going on, um, this could be fine, but you'd probably want to um, put the bowl here because the process of carving the bowl, because it's round, you can deal with swirly grain in a way that is way more of a pain in the neck if you were to put the bowl down here, uh, if you're trying to put the handle through that. With the handle you want as clean a grain as possible so that you can make whatever shape you want. And then with the bowl, it's fairly easy to handle that sort of thing. Now, whenever I have something like this that has a corner, um, I like to take off the corner. Just one hit there, one hit there, because as I'm holding on to it, that corner will dig into my palm. And by just taking it off just a little bit, I make it so much more comfortable. Because remember, with the axe, I'm basically <laughs> wailing this into my palm. And so if that sharp corner is there, every blow of the axe is driving it into my palm. <clears throat> Bought an axe I saw in a video. Didn't realize the guy was <laughs> seven feet tall. Oh, geez. Joseph, be careful. All right. Yeah, everyone be careful while you're watching this. Don't be doing something trying to watch me while you're swinging tools. Bad enough that I'm doing it. All right, so now that I've dug down into that weird bit and realized that the grain really isn't doing anything funny, I can walk the crank back up a little bit, up this billet of wood. Again, I want to give myself um, some space between me and the other part, um, between me and where the axe is going to be. Uh, Joseph, are you okay? Just let me know that you're not like bleeding all over the place there in Austria. So I imagine if you weren't okay, you wouldn't be able to type that you had hit yourself. So you probably shouldn't worry. All right, here we are. So that second cut, so I come in from the tip here, and then the second cut is really just, it's coming in real steep, and all it's doing is stopping these fibers from splitting further back up the billet. Um, so this, what is this? This is either young paper birch or it might be some of this um, gray birch I was talking about. Um, yeah, it's a little hard to tell on this particular piece. Um, but I have a little bit of both. There's uh, some town municipal land up the road where they dropped a bunch of birches along the roadside in this whole series of forests that they keep around a reservoir. And they were just letting those birches rot. So, you see how when I'm up here close to my hand, this axe isn't coming up high enough to actually come down on my hand at all. And then as I chase that cut lower, I can ply a little more pressure and a little more pressure. Super important to be safe here, guys. That's really important. Um, so yeah, so I, I harvested a whole bunch of birch logs. And when I say harvested, I basically mean I went and picked them up. I think you'll be fine. Okay, good. Um, I went and picked them up with my truck. It took about 10 minutes. And I got a truckload full of birch logs that were just lying on the edge of the woods there. Um, with nothing happening with them. So, 
Okay. I'm a big believer in uh, long spoon handles. I think a spoon handle should be about twice the length of the bowl. And part of that is that, um, you know, the, the spoon has to interact with your hand, but it also needs to interact with a bowl. And particularly, you know, for a bowl that's not like a little kid's bowl, your hand is down in the bowl if, if you make them too short. Okay. You'll notice that I sink my axe a lot into the stump, and that's a safety thing. If I'm not using my axe, I want it sunk into the stump firmly enough that it can't move on me. So you can see right here how my hand is forming a pivot and that the saw blade is pulling back and this uh, either the back of the, the axe head or depending on the height of the thing, in this case it's the handle itself here, is acting as a pivot stop so that this piece of wood, when my hand is here and this pulls like that, it comes up against it tight and it makes it a lot easier to saw. Um, doesn't always work, like this is too short, and I could either sink the axe closer to the edge, or I could just do without it. But since I'm sinking my axe anyways, it's a nice little trick to reduce the fatigue you have from sawing. Okay. Now, whenever I'm close to something and I have to get it absolutely right, you will never see me try and come down on something exactly on the line that I'm trying to hit. I always place, hold, and then use the mallet or the club to come down the way I want because um, when you swing, there's always the risk that you get it wrong. Sometimes there's a the risk that it bounces and hits your thumb. Sometimes there's just the risk that you screw up the work that you just did. So um, it's always a good idea to place and then use the club to get the uh, to get the force to make the cut. And that way your axe is precisely where you want it to be. So, again, just axing a little bit down the sides so that in the box they nest nicely together. And ideally, in a medium flat rate box, I can just, boom, stack a whole bunch of them together like that. <clears throat> What's this question? Is there a place for flat blanks or do you always work the crank like this? Pretty much everything I do has a crank. Um, everyone has their own style, so there are certainly people who, who really work the, the flat crank angle. Um, I have found that every single shape I carve is better with a crank, and so um, I tend to put one in, and I, also, I always find it uh, useful to put it in right at the beginning. That way there's no surprises. I know if I have enough room for the spoon that I want. Um, whereas if I had a flat blank, I could know by, uh, by experience whether I had enough width for the type of spoon that I was carving. But my carving is a little more fluid than that. I tend to sort of go with, um, go with the flow a bit. And if I see something that looks like it would be you know, if I see an opportunity to make a spoon because the wood is a certain size or a certain shape or if there's certain limitations imposed by the wood, then I can adjust to them. So axing in the crank helps expose those limitations or those opportunities right at the beginning. So I know sort of how to adjust what I'm doing so that I don't get backed into a corner. So that's why I like to do the crank right off the bat is so I know what my options are. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope that answered your question. So we all tend to um, ax more on one side than the other. So you can see, for me, um, I tend to, to lean in more on this side and not so much on this side. You see how it's actually 
from this angle. Um, wait, does that mean is that how it is? Let's see. No, you tend to you tend to, most people tend to axe more on the side of the beard of the axe that's towards themselves. So for me, that means this side. And then when you flip it around to do this stop cut, same deal. You're probably gonna lean more on one side than on the other side. Um, so uh, you can correct for it by just being aware that you're probably gonna lean more to one side than the other. You'll also notice that I don't try and you know clean up the face of the blank at all. Um, and if there's a twist to it, unless there's a really extreme twist, I tend to just leave the twist as something to be taken out as part of the carving process because that's by far more efficient than trying to true up the blank. Um, just truing up the blank a lot of times involves changing every uh, every angle of the handle and the bowls. When really, when you're doing it with a knife, all you need to do is just lower one side of the rim, and that's it. So, all right, here's a great example of why I do the crank first. So there's a knot here. I could probably have told that there was something there because there's a little bit of squirrely grain here. Um, but by exposing the knot as part of the crank, I can make sure that I draw in a shape that avoids it completely. Um, oh yeah, here's something I thought I was going to do a Spoonosaurus video on. I probably will eventually, but when I draw my shapes, I find that just drawing a really rough shape and being fairly swift, I get much sweeter lines than if I go painstakingly slowly. Um, much more of a sketch, right? Much more of a bunch of shapes, and then you can sort of see within them with your imagination which is the sweetest version of those things. Um, okay. So, when it comes time to get rid of this knot here, I'm going to have to be a little careful as I axe it so that I don't split the wood into the bowl in a way that I didn't intend. Um, probably. You can see that down here, I'm actually not as choked up on the axe so that I get a little more force with my swing. And I'm more forceful with my swing because I'm nice and far away from my hands. Now, it is important that you make sure that your, turn, your body's turned to the side enough that should this bounce off, it's not gonna hit you in the leg. Okay, so always being aware of what the possibilities are um, is absolutely crucial. Okay. All right, now I'm going to do just the sawing. Again, I use the axe head to stop the pivot. Now when you're sawing with these pull saws, a lot of times if you're pulling really hard, it's going to jam up because you're going to get a tiny little wiggle and that's going to create a, a difference in the kerf and that's going to create a pinch point. So what you want to do is nice even strokes. Hey, yeah, of course, Felicia. Um, you want to do nice even light strokes that aren't going to create a pinch point in that saw kerf. And then only when you get towards the end is it okay to power through at the end if you feel like it. All right, so like I said, this little knot here is going to become a bit of a problem uh, if I leave it. But what I don't want to do in this case is come down right from the top. Can you guys see well enough? It looks like the sunlight is... Um, let me see here. Uh, da. Alright, now I have to squint a bit, but is that better for you guys? Yes or no? Alright. So. Mm, loving this new tripod that I have. Much better. Okay. Okay, good. Um, so rather than go up here and try and split it down where 
this squirrely bit around here might dig into the side of the spoon here. Instead, I'm gonna attack it sort of right at the knot itself. And I'll come at it from one side. And then I'll come at it from slightly above the knot. Can you guys see that? Yeah, there you go. Um, and you can see now I'm closer to eliminating that knot. So if I go back and forth like that, then I am not going to get stuck with the grain diving into the bowl of the spoon. Okay. Good. There's that one. Okay, that's, uh, yeah, we're at six eating spoons for this box, so I'll probably switch and do a couple, <clears throat> couple scoops. I don't always use short stuff for scoops, but this uh, stub of a log is what was left um, when I finished fucking up this log, so in this case, that's what I'll use. Um, I find that with scoops similarly to other types of spoons, it can be really helpful to um, give yourself a little extra space so that you can keep your hands safe. Um, hold on, my stump here is listing to the side. Problem is some of this is frozen. All right, so here's another thing that can be nice. So I could just keep doing sort of really split chunks off of this, right? Or, or uh, tangential come down through the bark with this. But what might be more fun in terms of the, the shapes that I get is if I do some that are a bit off center. So if instead I do two that are like this so that um, and then rather than come down from this side, I, if I come down, so these are the growth rings here, with this lower piece here, uh, can you see that? With this lower piece here, with the growth rings like that, I'm going to get one of those beautiful scoops where um, I am using green wood. Yeah, this is, uh, it's green wood that's been sitting around the log for a while. So I'll get one of those beautiful scoops where you have the concentric rings, but they're off to one side. And those, uh, Barn the Spoon has, has said that he thinks those are some of the strongest spoons you can make because of the way the fibers run through the wood. And I also think they're one of the most beautiful. You want that first crack with the mallet to be strong enough to bite your ax in. This is particularly true if you're using frozen wood, which this is not, but you want to be careful about that. So, um... Yeah, so we'll see uh, how close to the edge the um, concentric rings are in this. Sometimes the concentric rings don't show up when you are axing. It's only when you start uh, actually carving the bowl that you realize you have these concentric rings. So, you can see how gentle my strokes are. And with a scoop, you know, for something like a classic coffee scoop that has a medium length handle, I find I don't need that second cut, the one that stops it from splitting. I just come in a little bit from one side, come in a little bit from the other side, get a little gentle camber to it. Um, and that way, but then here's the key, that you don't just center the scoop on that valley you in fact push the scoop up off the valley to one side and what you're doing is you're having the scoop be on one side of the valley and the scoop handle be on the other side of the valley 
And that's how you get a scoop that has a level rim, but yet, uh, there we go. It has a level rim, but yet has a handle that sticks up in the air, um, is by having the scoop be over here, and then the handle goes up to here. Temperature right now is, is 60. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely not frozen. Yeah, today is 60, tomorrow is supposed to be 70. We're in classic New England sugaring weather, where it gets warm during the day and then dips down below freezing at night. Yeah. So what's happening right now is <clears throat> one of the legs of my stump is on a frozen bit. There we go. And one is not on a frozen bit. So the non-frozen bit is um, keeps sinking lower and the frozen one stays put and the stump lifts to one side. So I do want to use up this birch um, this winter because it was sitting around for much of last summer. Some of it started to spalt. And I would say by the end of May or early June, it would start to become overly spalted uh, because the birch bark is so waterproof that the sap can't get out. So it spalts itself from the inside out. It doesn't even have to be lying on the ground to do it. Um, so I have all this birch and um, and I want to use it up and move it on out. And if I use it up and I need more, there's more down the road. And I'm also planning tomorrow to uh, harvest the yearly tree at the tree farm, the yearly birch tree, so that I have plenty of nice birch bark in the spring to keep working with. And uh, it's nice to harvest. So this is the trickiest part here with, um, with scoops. When you start doing this, you gotta be real gentle with your ax because you're working with such a stubby piece of wood that doing the ax work, you gotta be just little bits, little bits at a time. Because it's, you don't have much um, uh, mechanical advantage either. Normally with a long spoon, you've got a long handle that really helps you hold it steady. And with a short one, every ounce of pressure put on it by the axe here, you're basically counteracting with your hand here. Um, so what I like to do with this birch tree that I harvest, that I'll be harvesting tomorrow, right, is... Um, Take it down now when the sap's down, although the sap is going to start rising. Um, and so it already has a sort of as small amount of sap in it as possible. And then, where my piece of wood go? And then um, I let it sit on the ground as a whole log and I let it leaf out, uh, which it will do because it's, it's still trying to be alive. Um, and so once it leafs out, the leaves will transpire even more of the sap. So that's a really valuable part of the process. Um, and then once it's sat around for a while and the leaves has transpired as much and the leaves have then withered, and then I know that if they've sort of pushed out as much sap as they can, and then I either use it up as quick as I can, or I buck it up into short lengths, although you get a fair amount of cracking that way. Or I, uh, what I did last year was I tried a little experiment where I split a log lengthwise to see if it would evaporate enough that way. It won't evaporate as much as if you did it 
in short fucked up lengths because all the cap, you know, the capillaries aren't exposed in that way, but it did enough. The other thing I want to try is what Dawson does, where you actually split it up into billets, put it in a plastic tub, and uh, and just let it mellow in the plastic tub. That also seems like a good way to go. All right, so again, the scoop is going to be pushed up so that good two thirds of it is up on one face, and the other the other side is the handle and that way the rim of the scoop and the handle are on two different planes and that's what makes it so that you can have the scoop resting with the rim level and the handle be up in the air which makes it real easy to pick up afterwards so with this thing here I can now I can probably split this off but you got to be aware of how deeply it dips here so you don't want to split off too much you always want to be conservative when you do this little splitty off bit but it is helpful to do in terms of getting the whole thing to sit still for you while you trim down the ends with a saw this will sit a lot more still this way I also like to have my stump be quite uneven uh, because this gives me better holding options uh, if it can be flat and then also sort of pushed up against this up part up here that's a little higher. Um, so I like my stump to be uneven. I feel like that's a safer stump. And I also like my stump to be soft wood, or at least very weathered hardwood, so that the axe consistently bites in. Somebody suggested that having a soft wood stump might also keep your axe from getting dull as quickly. That's probably true. You could probably have a hardwood stump that would dull your axe much more so than this pine one does mine. Um, which, if you're like me and you sink your axe every time you aren't using it, that's a lot of a lot of time, and that could be quite a big factor in whether you need to sharpen your axe or not. So I've learned with the sawing to be patient. Let the saw do the work of the cutting. Whenever I hand the saw to someone and they're impatient, that's when it always jams up on them. Okay. Now again, always place the axe and then use the mallet so that you're controlled careful, you're not going to hit your fingers, you're not going to ruin your blank by accidentally hitting somewhere where you didn't intend to hit, and then just a little blank. You talk a bit more about my tree farm resource. How long do they need to be down to work with? Thanks so much for this. Yeah, so I have uh, 10 acres of Christmas trees. That's really, uh, it's really just a managed forest. And so um, there's all of these sort of margins on the edge of the Christmas trees that, uh, what am I doing now? That have deciduous trees and so I can harvest from those in whatever way makes sense to me for the farm. Um, we lease the farm so it is uh, here I'm just removing a split that I could see went too deep into the thing. So, uh, so basically I just sort of decide how badly I want a tree now versus how much it would make sense to leave it for later. Um, and if I want a tree now for the coming year, I try and think four to six months in advance of when I want it because I prefer carving spoons that have uh, sat around in the log for a while. I find they're just, the wood does a lot of shifting around and they don't warp as much as they dry. And, uh, and 
and they're also dry enough that you can usually just carve them right through to finish carving um, in one go and you don't have to wait for them to dry out before doing finishing cuts so um, you can see I'm actually cocking the axe quite a bit so as I waggle my hand it's biting into the wood right where I want it now until you have that familiarity with your axe Make sure you walk up, start low and walk up to where you want to be. Don't just try and hit exactly where you want to be because chances are you're going to hit higher than that. And if you're already within two inches of your hand, that's too high, that's not safe. So if you're not confident, walk your way up. Um, the other important thing, uh, what do you say about this? Walk your way up, oh, I'm sure I'll think about it. So. For me, I also harvest the firewood that I need for my little wood stove when I'm down there during the Christmas tree season. I'll harvest it from the edges of the grove as well. So um, there's an opportunity for me to take down some pin cherry. There's a whole bunch of birch. So there's a big paper birch that I'm going to take down this year, but there's also probably some black birch. I might take down some beech if I feel like there's a beech that could be mellow and sweet to carve. I haven't had much luck with the beach around my farm, but my farm is really a managed forest and so it's not like a big field that gets mowed with Christmas trees standing in the grass. It's, there's stuff coming up all over the place, which is nice. It gives me lots of options. hope that answered your question. Um, all right, I'm going to actually... So when you get this close to the end, you don't want to you really don't want to come up here and try and hit this here. It's too close to your hand, so turn it around. And then if you really want to, you can remove a little bit of this. But it's always worth remembering, so much of this stuff is easier and safer to do with the knife. You don't always have to use the axe. Uh, and in fact, I would highly recommend that people ask yourself really critically, what is worth doing with the axe and what can I get away with doing with the knife because a lot of times you'll be less of a danger to yourself with the knife and you will be less of a danger to screwing it up with the knife. It's just mistakes happen in slow motion with the knife and they happen at 60 miles an hour with the axe. So now we're moving on to some cooking spoons. Um, and I will trim down this thickness here, but I'm going to saw it off first so that I'm not trying to do quite as much cutting through. Let's see. Could you talk about your upcoming teaching and workshops? Sure. Happy to. So uh, there's a bunch of options if you're interested in learning from me. Um, option number one um, is you can always arrange for a private lesson at my house. It's $80 for a four-hour lesson. We usually go over, but I don't charge you anymore. I provide lunch, um, and the catch is you got to come to me. Um, and at least right now, I'm booking weekends in... Gosh, when am I booking weekends? I have a couple more weekends. I have one more weekend in April that's free to book, and then we're talking July. Um, weekdays, I, have, I'm, I can book much sooner than that, but I'm trying not to, uh, <clears throat> no, I don't carve dry wood. I carve wood that's been sitting around the log for a while, but it's still green. It's just done a lot of relaxing. Um, okay. So private lessons with me, if you can do private lessons during the middle of the, the school week, private lessons can be booked much sooner than that. But if you want a weekend lesson, uh, we're talking there's one option in April, and then we're talking July, so uh, my time there is fairly limited. I am, however, teaching uh, a number of workshops. I'm teaching one in April at Snow Farm in Williamsburg, Massachusetts. It's a craft and art school, um, and that's there. These are all. Let's see. These are all two-day workshops. Most of them are Saturday, Sunday, but there is one that is the middle of the week. Um, and then I'm teaching three workshops at the Adirondack Folk School out just south of Lake George. 
in Lake Champlain out in New York State. And one of those is coming up. It's right at the end of March. I'm doing the first one. And then I've got uh, and then I've got two more. I know one is in September and one is in, I want to say it's in July. Um, and then I'm going, but not doing any teaching at, I'm going to Greenwood Fest in June, where I'm excited to meet any of you guys that are going to be going. But again, uh, I'm not there in any official capacity. I'm just there to, to learn myself and, and see what I can figure out um, and meet you guys. Uh, and then, last but not least, on March 17th and 18th, Matt White, Temple Mountain, Matt and I are hosting the Spoonosaurus uh, gathering at his house in Temple, New Hampshire. Um, and I'm going to be doing a carving demonstration both of those days. It's a Saturday and Sunday, so I believe at 2 o'clock both days, I will be doing... A carving demo of my whole process start to finish it should take an hour or so um, and there won't be any formal learning at that event other than other than that but you know we're around and always happy to answer questions um, that being said uh, I'm also very open to answering any questions I can answer from you guys online in messages and emails you know to the best of my ability and and to the best of the time that I have I'm, I'm happy to help you guys um, so just reach out if you have questions so at this point I'm just doing more cooking spoons and the size of this log is really dictating for cooking spoons that they be tangentially split otherwise I wouldn't have quite enough width for these um, So yeah, and if you guys, if any of you guys know of any uh, places where I could teach, you know, where they would be interested in paying me to come and teach, I'm very open to reaching out to other places that might be closer to you. So uh, if you have a craft school or a folk school near you uh, that might be open to having a spoon carving class, reach out to them. Find out. Let me know. Um, uh, this is the time of year when I sort of do some thinking about how I'm going to book things next year. And this, between now and August, is really when these craft schools are figuring out their next year. So uh, if you think, gosh, we have a craft school an hour away, wouldn't it be cool if Emmett came and taught there? You're absolutely right. It would be cool if I came and taught there. Um, you should uh, let me know about it. Maybe reach out to them and see if they'd be interested um, and let them know that, you know, there's some local interest in having me come and teach because I'm, I'm always happy to explore those options. This one's got a cool bit of uh, streaking in, in the middle here. Um, sometimes in birch, it can be like that where you have a little sort of grit cell thing going on, but this is not lined up with that, so I know it's not... Um, there's not actually a crack associated with this. Um, now, sometimes by foreshortening the distance by looking down it like this, you can see if something is straight in a way that would be harder if you were looking at it here and trying to draw a straight line down. But if you look at it like this, it becomes real clear if you're going to one direction or the other. Um, so that's a nice little trick. So when I'm, when I'm drawing a straight line, I'll often tilt it down away from myself like this. So I foreshorten the perspective, make it appear shorter, and then I can tell if something is actually, um, actually straight or not. All right, guys, I think at the end of this, I'm going to uh, turn it off and put on some music. Um, but I, I've been in the habit now of uploading these to YouTube. If you just search for my name, which is the same as my handle here, I have a YouTube channel. It's got all of two videos on it. Um, 
and you can't see people's comments, but that's why I'm trying to do a good job of reading out people's comments. And now's a good time to ask any further questions. Can I say what my axe is and what grind it has? Have I done any videos of axe sharpening? I have not done videos of axe sharpening. My axe is a Granfer's Brooks carving axe. Um, it has a symmetrical grind on it, although I will say, boy, it, it wanders from one side down here to the other side up here. Um, but it's ground on both sides. I don't know the particulars of it. I love the weight of it. It's heavier than the Robin Wood axe I was using before, but it means that the axe is doing more of the work. Um, I, the other thing I really like about it is because the handle dips down, which is, is new to me, the, the Robin Wood axe handle is, comes out fairly straight. What it means is that my hand is closer to the center of, of gravity of this head here, which means that to torque it one way or the other takes less strain on my hand because it's quite happy to rotate any which way because I'm essentially holding it in the center of its gravity when my hand is at the bottom of this curvy bit here, um, which for an ax that has the handle coming straight out is not the case. And when you try and cock it in your hand to do some of these cuts that I'm talking about, getting it to bite in, it means that your hand is holding up the weight of this ax, um, which is just an extra little bit that you don't need to be doing necessarily. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I would totally recommend this ax. When I first started out, I just used whatever ax I could find at the hardware store and at tag sales, and I went through a whole bunch of different crummy axes, and then I got a Robin Wood ax, and that was a big step up. Um, and then Brian Dunbar was kind enough to send this to me in the mail, just out of the blue. And, uh, and boy, has it revolutionized my ability to power through this number of blanks in the day. I could totally do it with the Robin Wood axe. Um, it's just that this axe, uh, once you develop the muscles that allow you to swing this again and again and again, um, the weight of the axe does a lot of the work. Um, and that's really, that's really nice. Okay. You have the same axe. Seems to bounce off of cuts sometimes. Ah, uh, yes. Um, yeah, probably your axe has a convex grind or it has become rounded over time. If you go back to one of the first Spoonosaurus videos that Matt ever did, he did a whole series of Spoonosaurus videos where he was basically just him drawing on paper and describing why a convex edge uh, will tend to skitter off instead of bite in consistently. Um, and that would be very helpful for you. I sharpen axes when I sharpen them, which is very infrequently. Um, I sharpen axes with sandpaper wrapped around a wooden block, just like I do for sharpening my knives. Um, and then I hold the ax still and I go nice and slow like this. The temptation is to go really fast because you think you can do it accurately, but then one slip and you slice the side of your hand open on this ax edge because this is quite sharp. So treat it with respect. Go nice and slow. Start with 400 grit sandpaper, get it so that you see a consistent scratch marks going all the way out to the edge. If you flash it in the light and you see the bevel flashing at one point, but then if when the bevel's in shadow, you see a tiny little edge of light right at the edge, that's a sign that you haven't gone far enough and that you still have a little bit of uh, rounded over bit right at the edge and until that's completely gone and your entire sloyd bevel to the axe is either all in shadow or all in light then you haven't gone far enough so stick with that 400 grit until you have done that and then and then walk your way up through the grits I tend to go 400, 800, 1500, 3000 and then call it good um, like I said I, I prefer my axe, I want my axe to bite in consistently, but then I want my axe to be a little bit dull enough that it pops the wood apart nicely. Um, obviously, uh, a convex thing would, uh, wouldn't help with that, but that's that. Okay, I gotta go, guys. My time is up.